Hi, I'm Dr. Craig Chalquist. I'm core faculty in the East-West Psychology Program at the California Institute of Integral Studies. Have you ever noticed that sometimes the things that you own seem to have a personality of their own, especially when you lose them and you just can't find them anywhere? Have you noticed that certain towns or cities that you live in seem to be agreeable to you and make you happy and you feel good there and get things done, and then other places, they just seem to hate you. It just seems like everywhere you go, there's frustration. And then you move, and it all changes again. Have you noticed that your feelings flow differently in different settings? For instance, next to a healthy river, as opposed to one that's not healthy, one that's dammed up or misdirected or concreted over. Have you noticed that where you live has a huge rich history. It's in the ground in the geology and the plants and the animals and it's up above in the climate and the seasons. And have you noticed that you feel differently when your life rhythms are actually synchronized with those seasonal rhythms as well as the rhythms of day and night? Have you noticed any parallels between the fluctuations in your moods, your dreams, conflicts that you go through, strengths that you acquire, and processes that are happening in your surroundings, whether human or non-human. What does it mean, on a serious note, to live in a time of global ecological crisis? What sorts of stories and ideas and support will carry you forward and help you make sense of what's going on? How is it that the displacement of plants, animals, and entire ecosystems somehow has something to do with the displacement of people. And finally, what sorts of inclusive, just, earth-honoring, and even joyful possibilities for society still exist for us? And above all, what is Earth asking of you? So these are the sorts of questions that are posed by Terra Psychology and explored by Terra Psychological Inquiry. So what I've done is I'm putting together this rather, rather brief video with some notes I've taken down. And I'm doing this for the publication of my book, Terra Psychological Inquiry, Restoring Our Relationship to Nature, Place, and Planet, published in April by Routledge. This seems like a good opportunity to go over what is Terra Psychology anyway, and what is its research method or methodology, rather, terror psychological inquiry, and what sorts of inquiries are suitable for this. So let's have a definition first of terror psychology, um, and a kind of an informal one. So you could think of terror psychology as an extension of psychology that studies how to deepen and re-enchant our relations with the things around us, such that they're not just dead objects. We don't just live in a world of disconnected things. We live in a world of presences and relationships that get inside of us and that we're ultimately not separate from. So Terra Psychology includes ideas and practices for reimagining those deep relationships and telling different stories about how we're connected to place and planet and each other and ourselves. So you can think of Terra Psychology, which has been around since, uh, you know, I, I can't coin the term in about 2000, but it's been in uh, a going field since maybe 2007 when the first Terra Psychology book was published. You could think of it as the deep study of how the things around us get into our hearts. And then the other side of it is how the heart responds to the things outside of us, how very often what we think of as personal and interior is actually deeply connected with processes that are happening all around us. And so Terra Psychological Inquiry is, as I said, the research part, the research arm of Terra Psychology. And TI is a set of earth honoring qualitative and interpretive techniques, methods, practices for studying how consciousness and our surroundings deeply interact with each other. Terra Psychological Inquiry has been used by masters and doctoral students of psychology, eco-psychology, various environmental programs in the humanities 
since 2007. And in all that time, the work done by my students has been, and by people who weren't my students, has been growing and changing and moving in directions that I, for one, would never have anticipated. So I want to emphasize, and then I have a little quotation I want to read you from the book. Um, what we're talking about are deep relations rather than shallow literal ones. And so, for instance, there's a place for research on, let's say, the effect that sunlight has on the speed with which people walk down the sidewalk. That's pretty much ordinary ecological or environmental research. And it, it studies uh, very simple cause and effect relations. It uses the framework of natural science. And so TI uses a different framework. We use inquiries that are more rooted in the humanities. And I'm going to say more about that momentarily. But uh, if you think of depth as the metaphors and the symbols and the felt relations and the fantasies that actually not only connect us with the things around us, but that bear testimony to, to the fact that we are always connected. And so we proceed from a somewhat different assumption than natural science does, which takes things as separate right from the very beginning and then tries to prove some sort of connection. The move that we make is to assume that everything is connected already. And how does making that move give us new forms of knowledge and practice and new appreciation for our lives here? So this is a quotation from the book uh, published by Routledge. Nature, place, element, climate, geology, plants, animals, and biology are not just backdrops to human concerns. No, they are full partners whose influences we learn to sense and work with, dance with, appreciate, be challenged by, and love. The key that opens the door to these human and more than human relationships is our dawning understanding of the stories that we share with the natural living world, whether from a mountaintop, the middle of a river, a neighbor's backyard, Earth's orbit, or the heart of a glass and asphalt metropolis. So we not only look at our connections to the natural world, but also to the built world too. How psychologically can we understand these deep relationships and resonances and how do they show up in us and how does our internal process reflect them? That's the inquiry. That's at the very heart of it. And so there is a need for a fresh earth honoring psychological practice, research approach, set of lenses. And uh, it begins with the fact that for the most part, mainstream Western psychology uses too narrow an idea of the sense of self. It's a hyper-individualistic idea. The separate self has been shown over and over again through multiple disciplines to be largely an illusion. It's not that we don't have an individual identity. Of course we do. Everybody in every culture has an individual identity. But the self doesn't stop at the skin. The things that are around you, the, the things that you own, and that sometimes feel like they own us. <laughs> um, the houses that we live in, the people that we talk to every day, these are all parts of us too. We need some adequate psychology for helping us understand how these are parts of us and how we're parts of them and you know how relational all this is rather than just a bunch of nouns interacting with each other. There's a whole, by the way, forgotten dimension of psychology, the nature dimension. Uh, it's showing up more and more urgently now because of climate change and eco-anxiety. But, you know, if you look at the founders of psychology in the West, many of them had this very powerful connection to the natural world that the textbooks usually don't talk about. So we may read in a textbook, just to take a few exam examples, we may read about Gustav Fechner being uh, an early researcher on, let's say, sensory thresholds, which is what he studied. But what doesn't appear in the textbooks is that he was a tremendous nature mystic uh, in the experiential sense of the word mystic. He was fascinated by the beauty of the natural world and his garden and 
he went through a period of blindness for a while, and then when his eyes opened once again and he could actually see out of them, he was rapturous about the beauty that he saw on every side. And he, he had to write about this under a false name so that his scientific colleagues wouldn't condemn him and not take him seriously anymore, and then he would lose his job. There's Pierre Jeanet, one of the founders of depth psychology. The psychology that studies are the, rare, the uh, interrelation between conscious and unconscious mind. Tremendous Gardener, a lot of his writing is full of gardening metaphors um, that inform his work and his perceptions. There is, of course, Freud, who may have been one of our first animal-assisted therapists. He, he had his dog in treatment sessions very often, and uh, against the rules that later came to be, he would go on long walks with his clients, they called them patients back then, um, around Vienna and just talk and be outside. Um, he took vacations in nature, went mushroom hush hunting, all kinds of things. Carl Jung, he had a powerful connection to nature from childhood, and this not only appears in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, but Meredith Sabini has pulled together a fine collection of Jung's nature writings under the title, uh, the, the Earth Has a Soul, so we can read about it from Jung himself. And then one of the people he trained was an analyst named um, Jane Wheelwright, and she wrote a book called The Ranch Papers, and she, we look at her as a, a, one of the first terra psychologists. She just was very connected to the presence of place and took it, took it seriously. The, her, the ranch that she lived on was um, not just a, a background um, or a backstory to the story of her life. Her, her life was deeply woven into the place itself, and that's evident through the book. So another reason for a fresh psychological perspective is that the tools of psychology, which work pretty well in their own contexts, weren't built to deal with global disaster. They weren't built to deal with what's being called eco-anxiety, in which I refer to constantly as, it's not anxiety anything, it's rational fear. People read the news about what's happening, and they're scared, and they should be. That's, that's a healthy response. Uh, Stephen Harding, the ecologist, says that if, if you're up on the news about climate change, for instance, and you're not upset, you need to go to therapy and figure out why you're not upset. So psychology doesn't handle this sort of thing. It handles trauma on the level of um, relationships and internal trauma and group trauma and things like that. But we need new tools, new ideas, new stories for dealing with global crisis. So uh, another problem too is that mainstream psychology, particularly in the, in the United States, is uh, pretty much totally, not only politically self-serving, but actually an active tool in the hand of authoritarian regimes, mass advertisers, um, clients are now called consumers. Um, this sort of perspective, which is so deeply implicated in the decline of the planetary ecosystems, is not going to be helpful for reconnecting us with those ecosystems in any beneficial way. So I wrote a paper a while back and, and posted it online. It's called uh, Can Psychology Cure Itself? And it's at the website terrapsych.com, T-E-R-R-A psych.com if you want to read it. So this is the part of the need for terra psychology and for its research arm, terra psychological inquiry. Now um, there's another branch of terra psych I should mention too that goes with all this. So I mentioned TI. I'll also briefly mention something called earth dreaming. And so Earth Dreaming is the name of the practice arm of Terra Psychology, <clears throat> and it's all about reconnected practices. It gets some of what it does from fields like ecotherapy. So there are lots and lots of ways to uh, renew one's sense of relationship with the natural world, with plants, with animals, with, with whole regions. So uh, Earth Dreaming is a part of all this too. And some of the people who have used terapsychological inquiry build earth dreaming practices into it, as you can see from the master's work and the dissertations that have been done, as well as things that are done outside of academia. And I'll mention at this point that the terapsychological inquiry book 
is written so that the inquiry methods in it can be used by non-academics as well as people in academia. So with TI, we have an earth honoring set of tools for studying how deeply we, we interact with the places where we live, the geology and climate, plants and animals, infrastructure, cities and towns, and the whole rich, busy complexity of our profound but often disregarded embodiment in locale here on Earth. So in terms of the research, I mentioned that TI is a qualitative inquiry method. So qualitative research was built by people who realized that the natural science model has serious problems when it comes to studying human nature and human experience. From Galileo forward, the classical natural science model deliberately excludes subjectivity as erroneous, flawed, limited. It's built to exclude human experience. Qualitative research is built to welcome in, in a systematic and disciplined way, not only human experience, but the stories behind it, the depths of it, the lived experience, which we do not dismiss as merely anecdotal, and the paradigm isn't about proving anything. Uh, it's not about establishing oversimplified cause-effect relationships. It's about unfolding all the richness of a certain story or a certain locale or a social justice situation so that we understand it in a deep way, not a superficial way. It does bring in ways to check on our subjectivity because the natural science model is right, that there are errors and biases that are introduced. But the way forward is not to be stuck in some fantasy of objectivity, um, some delusion that we could ever be rid of all those biases, but to actually go forward into them and to open them up into pre-understandings and be able to correct the errors that we make. And that's one of the reasons that terapsychological inquiry uses some form of a team of people off-site who are constantly working with the inquirer. Sometimes in academia, that takes the form of, let's say, a dissertation committee or maybe a panel of advisors for master's work. And outside, it can look different. But there's always a group of people working on things so that it's not just a matter of having one's projections onto the research topic or the place or whatever it is that you're studying and then somehow thinking that's ac accurate knowledge. So I would say actually that qualitative research in general is more rigorous at eliminating subjective bias than using the natural science model is. TI can be used as a mixed methods approach and what that means is it can be used with let's say surveying and data collection and other kinds of natural science tools because they do reveal information from the outside. They see things from a distance and it's not to say that all that information is wrong. It, it can be useful. We just need to remember that it's from the outside and from a distance and so terapsychological inquiry actually can be combined with those kinds of methods just so long as we're clear that those methods are used in the context of what we think of as whole person research. We welcome in the body, we welcome in dreams and intuitions and everything that can give us information, which we then carefully look at so that we're not either falling into our own subject, subjective biases and projections on the one hand, or on the other hand, pretending that we're just brains on legs. So, terapsychological inquiry began at the same time that terapsychology did. And uh, the way this started was there were three of us who were graduate students, me, Matt Cochran, and Lolly Mitchell. Um, with me, it was place that was really urgent and up for me during my doctoral research. Places in California in particular. I was born in San Diego and I started having these incredible dreams where San Diego itself would tell me things about itself and I, I would wake up and think how in the world is this possible I the place says something about itself in a dream and I go I drive there and it's true <laughs> it actually is revealing to me sides of itself how is this possible so I, I began working on my own form of this methodology so that I could understand these experiences I could understand just how deeply 
the presence of place can reach into us. So in Matt's case, Matt Cochran, uh, his background is geology as well as depth psychology. And so he was asking this question, um, what would happen if we took all these kind of clunky mechanistic terms that we use in psychology and we replace them with ecological language? And because he's a geologist, he started using a geological vocabulary. And his writing is quite beautiful. Uh, he, for, to take one example, when he talks about defenses, which are the ways that we protect ourselves emotionally from things that we can't process. Um, they, they used to be called mechanisms of defense. Now we just pretty much say defenses. But there are things like denial and rationalizing and all those ways we lie to ourselves because we're, the truth is too much to it. For, to process at one point or another. And so defenses over the years that they're used often wear down, and particularly as you get older. And so Matt said, well, what if we call that weathering? The process by which erosive forces like wind and water gradually wear down the toughness of rock. And, and how might human nature look differently when we start looking for the pockets of passionate magma inside the psyche and fantastic crystalline and mineral structures, and his writing is really beautiful. So he gives this, this, this whole set of metaphors with which we look at ourselves as aspects of Earth, and it really makes us feel closer to where we come from and where we evolved than some of the, the more distant language of psychology can do. In Lolly Mitchell's case, she was living in uh, Escondido, California, where the first people who lived there, the Kumeyaay people, had put incredible petroglyphs up on, on the uh, hills above the town. And so she saw those and she started asking herself questions like, when we make art, what happens if we actually invite in the natural world as a partner? Not just as raw materials, not just as a backdrop, but actually sat there reflectively with wherever we're making art and asked it to sort of come in and help us do that. Do we not co-create art in a sense? And so as an art therapist, she was training people to do that. And so the three of us uh, gradually decided that we like that term, uh, terror psychology, which floated into my mind one day when I was thinking about the work that we do. And so from there, we started teaching people inside and outside academia, what we were doing, and all three of us encouraged them, take this, which is just the beginning, and run with it. Do creative things with it. Reconnective creative things, and that's exactly what's happened over the years. So gradually, terapsychology and terapsychological inquiry moved beyond place and beyond geological metaphors and beyond art, although it still includes all of those as a vital part of what it is, but it moved in so many different directions. And I'll talk about those in a moment and give you some examples. So there's a three phase process that the methodology takes people through. And the first, the first phase is called prepare. And so it's picking a site where you're going to do the work, if it is local, um, or just picking a site where you will um, work on whatever your project is, whether or not it has to do with a particular locale. Uh, you do some homework on your topic, you build a team that can help you through the whole process of everything and accompany you. Um, you begin a series of internal inquiries and a research journal, and there's a number of other steps to take as well. So that's the preparation phase. Phase two is investigate. So it's prepare, investigate, coagulate investigate is the work on the topic itself. So field work, if you do that kind of topic, interviewing, if you choose to use that methodology, comparing bodies of knowledge, if you work theoretically, <clears throat> monitoring internal body states and moods, monitoring dreams, collecting data through multiple modes of, per of perception, and documenting everything in a variety of ways. Many of our researchers also like to use photography, video, audio, and art as they record everything. So in classical qualitative research investigation, this is called things like leaving a paper trail or thick description. That's part of what's built into the methodology. And then the third phase is coagulation, so uh, which is an alchemical term. So 
um, alchemy in the sense not just of making gold, which is just a very shallow understanding of alchemy, but as a, a wisdom path involving reconnecting with nature in different forms. So when we coagulate the results, we do a data analysis when it's needed. Uh, we do a thematic analysis when it's needed. We analyze the motifs and the themes that come up through the interviews, through our own experiences in the field, through the way that we study, not only the content of what we study, which again is what natural science sticks to. We tend how you study it, because at some point when the research is deep, it works its way into the process by which we study the topic. It's very rich when that happens and often surprising. Coagulate uh, also includes um, making plain the rationale for the data analysis and the thematic analysis if the researcher chooses to do those. And all of that is determined by the research question and we spend a lot of time at the very beginning formulating a good research question and sometimes it changes because that's the nature of knowledge. It evolves and so we, we continue to use that as a lens for what's relevant to the study. Uh, the final product of the coagulation phase is called a transmuting exposition and in some qualitative methodologies there's some sort of a final synthesis or, or a report that's generated and um, or produced and uh, very often it can include art or video and we bring all of that in. Um, we want it to have a transformative effect not only on the researcher who's been under transformation through the whole process of the research. Uh, this happens every time we do this research. But we want it to transform the audience as well, whoever receives the research. The groups that are involved in uh, hearing about it and seeing it, we want them to participate too. And oftentimes when people do this uh, kind of inquiry, they will actively involve the people who uh, are in their research community. So let me give you a couple of examples of topics. So uh, finding safe home places and sanctuaries for particularly for demonized or marginalized groups of people. How, where, when, and why certain groups of people who are looking for belonging or homecoming congregate in certain places. And so um, C.K. Oliveri did a study on this, a doctoral dissertation in 2017, and she was asking herself about queer spaces, which are where it's the term in use for where queer people find some kind of a haven of understanding and support in a homophobic culture. So she was asking, because she lives in San Francisco, where, where are, not only where are the queer spaces in San Francisco, but why are they there? What's the, what's the deeper reason? And, what does it have to do with the place itself? Not just this, the built city, but also the entire history of it and the geography of it. And are there themes that bind all those areas of experience together? So a topic could be exploring the impact of ecological damage and healing on the psyches of the people living near where this occurs. And so Mike Haber is about to defend a dissertation in which he's looking at how it is that people with severe addictions tend to congregate unconsciously but consistently near the most damaged parts of the San Lorenzo River in Santa Cruz. Also, uh, Mike has Native American ancestry and he is drawing on some of that rich wisdom in order to do this study. Terra Psychology has uh, an ongoing set of conversations with indigenous people who still have intact traditions of uh, animistic ways of working with the world. We take those seriously. Uh, we may understand them from a different frame because we didn't grow up in tribal cultures. Some of us who do the work and some like Mike uh, have experience with it that we don't. But um, one of the things that TI does is in parapsychology is that we, we try to explore and validate that aspect of experience collective experience. So earth dreaming, I mentioned earlier that this is the practice arm of terra psychology. Which practices work best where and when? Um, that's a good study. So archetypal geology, that's what Matt Cochran calls this, uh, what he calls deep earth's running engagement with the deep psyche and writes beautifully about it. 
Um, I can't resist the temptation to actually read you a little of what he wrote, so let me do that. Uh, thinking about how the psyche, which we, when we say psyche, we mean conscious and unconscious together, uh, the self. This is what he writes. The fact is, we are born with these primary cracks, cleavages, our fault lines, our fractional crystalline structure, just like any stone, igneous, sedimentary, or metamorphic. We are marked by strata, vesicles, textures. Look at our labyrinthine brains. And these portals and pathways lead, lead into our deep cavernous interior with unrecognized fossils, generations of petroglyphs, symbols of old, our clandestine chambers full of passionate magma, our ancient water pockets, veins mineralized. Somehow through weathering, we become more visible. We are seen. That's from Matt Cochran's piece, The Arrows of Erosion. Uh, another topic, aerodynamics. Aerodyme is a term I coined a while back to describe how it seems like entire eras, entire eras somehow form around certain archetypal images. So an example would be how 400 years ago with the rise of science and industry, uh, not only in the West, but in many parts of the world, uh, they all seem to revolve around the image of the big machine. So the big machine would be an example of an aerodyne. And there have been other ones too. In medieval times, perhaps the heavenly city was the guiding archetypal image for huge aspects of human endeavor, population, politics, religion. It gets into all different areas. And so since 1968, we have what's possibly a new image, which is, of course, Earthrise. Um, as Muhammad Ahmed Ferris, the astronaut from Syria, put it when he first went into orbit, from space, I saw Earth, indescribably beautiful, with the scars of national boundaries gone. So a good topic would be, what does it really mean to live in an era of Earthrise? What are the implications? What can we do with that? So another topic, understanding how place and nature influence language. Uh, another would be um, creating a set of embodied ways of living and practices for use in the big city. Annabelle Berrios went to New York Open Center and taught a class on this. So embodied nature connection in the heart of a metropolis. A topic would be storytelling, peacemaking, and childhood development and how those would go together. Another would be, and uh, to some extent, Kelly Carlin deals with this. Uh, mythic motifs that play out in contemporary eras like the mass media, new technology, and other areas could be high finance, the built environment, current politics. What are the myths, what are the recurring mythic motifs and images, the old stories that reinvent themselves spontaneously? Because it happens all the time, as Young and Joseph Campbell and a host of other people have pointed out. What if sustainable food production, and I'm thinking of uh, permaculture, agroforestry, indigenous practices that have been proven over thousands of years, what if these were informed by the presence of the place itself? What would that look like? Instead of simply mowing down a place and planting things. So we have something to learn from indigenous planting practices there. So uh, Leanne Fay did a study, uh, sea songs and myths as they enrich travel and oceanic exploration, dissertation at CIIS. Uh, appreciating beauty as a means to appreciate, protect, and love nature. Rebecca Elliott has written about this in a book called Rebirths, um, with the births part spelled like Earth, C-A-R-T-H-S. Um, how does, another topic, how does the ecological integrity of a large lake, in this case the Great Salt Lake, parallel social processes in those who live near it? Maggie Hitman did uh, a study on this, a parapsychological inquiry. And then I mentioned Lolly Mitchell earlier, so making art with the natural world as a full partner. Katrina Davenport for a while worked on a project and 
I'd like to see this expanded on. It was called Terra Places and it ran online and it invited people to contact the, her and the, the people working on this project and provide stories and photographs and information about where their home was, their neighborhood, uh, the region that they lived in. And so it was the beginning of a kind of Terra psychological map, a, a map of not just geological features, although those were on it too, but local ecologies, local legends, local folk tales and things like that. That's a great topic. Kevin Filicamo did his master's work on learning about how our own instinctively erotic bodies feel in, and function through deep encounters with non-human entities like trees and mountains. So a kind of eros of nature. Uh, yet another topic, restoration of indigenous land-based spiritual practices especially among people whose practices have been su suppressed, outlawed, and lost. Um, connected to this would be uh, resurrecting tribal stories and rituals and art and music to promote healing in the indigenous inhabitants of lands stripped of forests, which was the case in South Africa. Clinical psychologist and terror psychologist Garrett Barnwell is working with people there on that project. There's one that we call, uh, um, excuse me, psychocartography. It's the whole question of who mythically, archetypally is here. Why is it that certain myths, folk tales, and so on seem to collect in certain locales? Uh, Sarah Rankin did some master's work on this with the town of Petaluma, California, where she saw the recurring fiery imagery of the phoenix reinventing itself there. Uh, I've looked a little bit into the presence of Dionysus in San Francisco. It's like the whole city's his altar. It's amazing. In Hong Kong, there was the figure of the Luton, who is a hybrid figure, a, a kind of um, merman figure. And when you think about hi the hybrid, the hybridity of Hong Kong, how it's all these different contrasting elements come together there. So there's the harbor and then the mountains right next to it. There is the colonial history and uh, Hong Kong being part of China. There's the dual languages that function there. So the Luton is in many ways a concise and, a, and uh, relevant image that kind of dis, it represents a distillation of, of the theme of different collecting sides of human experience that actually go on in Hong Kong. So there's this relationship between images of folklore and the dynamics that play out in specific places. Uh, another study would be what we call terrestry, which is deep ancestry. Lola McCrary has done work on this. So the relationship of ancestry and recurring themes that come up through ancestry to the places where our ancestors lived and traveled. And how do those play out in our families? So I have a couple of um, quotations I want to read you that I think speak to this element of terror psychology as our inquirers have actually used it. And so um, the first one is this. Um, these, are from, these are both from, from authors. Uh, not parapsychologists, but we, but they inspire us. I learn that the writer's pen is a microphone held up to the mouths of ancestors and even stones of long ago. The magic of this is not so much in the power of the microphone as in the ability of the non-human object or animal to be and the human animal to perceive its being. That's Alice Walker writing in her collection of essays, Living by the Word. And then this next one, for the Kiowas, referring to a Plains tribe here in the States, the beginning was a struggle for existence in the bleak northern mountains. It was there, they say, that they entered the world through a hollow log. Along the way, they acquired horses, the religions of the Plains, a love and possession of the open land. And in the course of that long migration, they had come of age as a people. They had conceived a good idea of themselves. 
they had dared to imagine and determine who they were. That's N. Scott Mamaday from a way, The Way to Rainy Mountain. He also mentions that there's an old woman he talks to who tells him stories of the Kiowa people. And there's this beautiful passage where he says something like, after hearing her for a while, I, I started to have the feeling that I was hearing not just from her, but the voice of the land itself. So a few more examples of topics. Um, the relationship between eco-resilience, so being able to flourish in the face of ecological adversity, the relation between that and meaning-making and re-mythologizing, so updating the old stories to find their relevance for our time. Reintroducing people of color to the sometimes overpowering presence of natural settings while respecting and tending to ancestral trauma that traumas that arise. And my friend and colleague Phoenix Smith does this. She does ceremonial and ecotherapy work with groups of African Americans who very often, uh, in, in terms of ancestry, you know, the forest was not the safe place for them. It was a place of danger. And so to go out in natural settings often brings up these, these deep intergenerational uh, feelings of peril. Uh, and it brings up a lot of other things, too, about race and what's happening currently in this country. So uh, Phoenix takes that work on and she she works with people, the end result of which often is a new sense of the presence and abundance and goodness of the natural world and the resources that are available there. So um, a few more examples of topics, maybe nature education for children using art, music, and gathering and telling local stories that include features of the ecosystem's characters. Uh, the appropriate and transformative uses of plant medicines with the plants as emissaries of the intelligence of nature. I'm working with a student right now who is part of a long lineage of people from Peru who do plant medicine work. So this is part of her dissertation topic. Uh, work with the presences that are found at sacred sites. Ecological embodiment and ecological embeddedness. This is uh, Tim Moynihan's term. He graduated from CIS. Uh, his study was to explore the presence of nature, place, or the elements through how they actually talk to the body. What about community festival organizing? to celebrate or bring attention to neglected aspects of a local nat natural feature or locale that's been done outside of academia, as well as inside. Um, looking at planting and gardening, which listen to the land and take the presence of place into account. So making it actually a conversation instead of just an operation on nature. What about the huge potential for animal communications and interspecies communication studies, community building across species, um, plant-based or nature-informed reconciliation, excuse me, place-based or nature-informed reconciliation among groups traditionally hostile to each other. There's a technique that ecotherapists sometimes use that I think could be scaled up, which is we're so, in the West especially, we're so used to being inside all the time um, that when we, for instance, get into a disagreement with a partner or a family member, we forget that these walls tend to compress the conversation's emotions a little bit. And it feels different from when you have these difficult conversations outside where there's all this space for holding all that emotion. So... Just as a little um, experiment, try that yourself. Uh, oftentimes when I have to have tough conversations with people, when it's possible to, I suggest that we go for a walk. And they tend to go better when it's outside. So eco-justice, focusing on the relationship between oppressed or marginalized people and some aspect of nature or place where they live. I mentioned C.K. Oliveri earlier. Her work took that on, so did... Master's work by Amanda Leach. And then uh, a couple more. So eco-spirituality, developing reverent practices that
that appreciate the soulful or spiritual aspects of the natural world. And then enchantivism, which is a, a word that's been in use for a couple of years now for telling the kinds of stories that not only spring from and uh, pay some kind of attention to the traumas and the ruptures where they originate, but that are more spacious than that. So for instance, um, one could create a whole enchantivism practice out of telling stories about our current situation of global ecological peril, peril. And so the story's not finished if we stay with the trauma. And in many cases, just staying with the trauma is re-traumatizing. Um, it's not a mystery to, to people that do this work why there are still big sectors of the public that are in denial about climate change defenses. We talked about those earlier, right? But if you can tell stories in groups of people that actually offer some hope, some way to move forward together, that has a very different outcome. And that can be heard. That can be listened to. So it introduces the whole dimension of wonder, of inspiration. It pulls people to imagine better futures than simply pushing them from behind with do this, or you should do that, or what have you, which a lot of us have had quite enough of. So wh what do we hope for? What do we imagine could be better? That's enchantivism, part of it. So this list of topics um, will undoubtedly expand as people make creative use of terapsychological inquiry. What's core to all of them, I think, is using somatic, emotional, and intellectual tools for restoring and reimagining complex relations of selfhood, kinship, culture, belonging, place, the elements, and the more than human world. I have to say here at this point that I'm so happy and proud and gratified at the creativity, the integrity, the, the deep earnestness of the students who have taken on incredible, rich, difficult, um, often troubling topics and alchemically created amazing gold with them, new experiences, new insights. It's just been wonderful work and it goes in ways I, I'm glad to say I could never have anticipated. One, one person using their own methodology can do certain things, but um, the, the, the genius of a group of people, of a whole co collective, uh, that's unsurpassable and it gives me hope. So uh, I want to finish by mentioning a couple of things. At the very beginning, we talked a little bit about deep as um, not just literal surface relationships between supposedly separate things, but deep in terms of relationships of symbol and metaphor and imagination and intuition and feeling and finding ways to restory, not only restore, but restory, they tend to go together. Those deep relationships many of which have become frayed or even broken. Stories, in the end, as we see with terapsychological inquiry and the ways that it's been used, sum up the deepest truths of human experience, whether scientific or sacred, but always as dramatic, even when they're being used diagnostically. Stories have not only helped structure our big brains, but they've joined our sense of meaning to, to kinship with the earth and with the sea and with the sky, with ourselves and with each other. And that's what terapsychological inquiry for us to do it is all about. Thanks so much.